one to the 23rd meeting of 2018 of the ECLEAR Committee. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Alec Neal and Claudia Beamish. Uh, we're sorry that they can't be with us. Uh, and before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to please switch off their mobile phones and any other electronic devices which might affect the broadcasting system. And so we'll move to agenda item one. Uh, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed to take items three and four in private? Thank you very much. Um, the next item is, uh, is to undertake the pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish Government's budget for 2019-20 in a round table format. Um, this morning uh, we're uh, very grateful to many people coming to support this uh, session and we're joined by uh, Riddle Graham who's the Director of Industry and Destination and Development at Visit Scotland. We're joined by Ian Gillan, Chief Executive Officer Zero Waste Scotland. We're also joined by John Johnny Hughes, Chief Executive of Scottish Wildlife Trust, as well as Phil Mackey, uh, the lead consultant in public health, SMASH, if that's the right way of pronouncing that acronym, and head of the Scottish Public Health Network, NHS Health Scotland. And we're also um, joined by Francesca Osovaska, Chief Executive and Accountable Officer of Scottish Natural Heritage. So we now move um, to this uh, session, the question and answer session. And um, if we just go straight to the questions, this is going to be a, a sort of round table format, uh, as I've, I've said. So um, Finlay, if you'd like to kick off and, and get the, the discussion going. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, what I would like to do is, is try to understand how the, our budget in this committee contributes to some of the national uh, outcomes. Uh, my question is specifically uh, on what benefits for the economy and jobs is there of maintaining a high quality natural environment, landscape and biodiversity uh, and to what extent are these benefits realised? So, so initially I suppose my question is to Visit Scotland and to SNH. Um, Thanks very much. Um, I, I think, um, just to set it in context, all the visitor surveys we've ever carried out uh, make it very clear that Scotland's scenery and landscape is the key motivation for visitors coming to Scotland. In fact, I've got the figures in front of me. 50% of the people that were, were asked about why did they come to Scotland in the first place, it was the scenery and the landscape. So that is absolutely a key driver to, uh, to bring visitors to the country, particularly international visitors. So um, the, the importance of the environment um, is, cannot be uh, understated. Um, and we play a very important role in promoting that as part of our, our uh, overall marketing activity, both uh, online um, and through all the other partnership uh, work that we do. And we work very closely with Scottish Natural Heritage and a whole range of uh, related issues that promote uh, the countryside and scenery. We're part of the National Walking uh, and Cycling Network, uh, and we also promote Scotland's Great Trails, which uh, um, is all about access to the countryside. So those two aspects um, are, are very important in relation to our overall activity. On the back of that, I, I declare an interest because I'm uh, very much involved in the campaign for a Galloway National Park. So, can you can you give uh, some examples on how important uh, na the na establishment of the, the two national park parks we have at the moment have been uh, in attracting visitors? Obviously, um, again, we work very closely with both national parks, um, and they're they're very different uh, purely because of the, their size and scale and, and location. Um, and they, they suffer from different uh, visitor pressures depending on uh, their, their actual location. So the, the Loch Lomond Park, uh, hugely important for day visitors, particularly from the Central Belt. Um, and we've been working with them uh, in helping to promote the, the new access agreements that they, they've brought into place. And obviously uh, in Cairngorms, we work um, predominantly through the Cairngorm Business Partnership, which is the industry group there uh, in relation to um, 
uh, ensuring that the businesses in the park benefit from tourism in, in, in the most appropriate way. And they've got a very active group there um, that promote the quality of the visitor experience as part of their overall promotional activity as individual businesses. So um, they're clearly different, but they both attract um, significant numbers of visitors um, in, in, in different ways. So, so you're saying that the, the National Park has a positive effect on visitor numbers? Um, the two national parks that exist at the moment clearly have, um, and I'm very aware of the, the campaign for additional national parks throughout the country. Um, I live on the borders. Um, I'm part of the South, South of Scotland partnership, and it's a key element of, of the activity down there. So um, we've been lobbied fairly heavily by, by the group uh, trying to uh, encourage new national parks. Um, I remain to see the evidence that, that uh, they will significantly increase visitor numbers, but I recognise that there is an argument for that. Okay. Okay. Would you like um, to say something? <coughs> yeah, thanks very much, um, convener. And just coming back to Finlay's initial question about the benefits to the environment, uh, sorry, the benefits to the economy of the environment and the natural world. Um, I think, as, as Riddle said, just to reinforce the point about Scotland's landscapes and how that helps market um, Scotland PLC. If anybody has watched the really kind of powerful Scotland is now film, um, you can see that Scotland's landscapes um, and natural beauty are ever present within that. Maybe looking a bit wider, one of the areas of work that uh, SNH has been keen to promote is what's called a natural capital approach. And this is about ensuring that we're able to um, quantify uh, Scotland's natural assets and the benefit that can be derived over the, uh, you know, a long time horizon to the economy. Uh, and see the environment in that way as an asset, but an asset as with all assets in a, in a business dimension that needs to be protected or otherwise it will be depleted um, and will not be able to contribute long term. Um, current estimates suggest that Scotland's natural capital is, around, is worth around £20 billion per annum to the economy, which includes um, tourism, renewable energy, food and drink um, and other sectors. I just wanted to come back, if I might, to the, the question I think that the committee's hoping to get some, some thinking on, which is how collectively the organisations you have in the room contribute to national outcomes and how we work um, together to do that. So if I just pick two that are particularly relevant to SNH, which are we value, enjoy, protect and enhance our environment, and then maybe pertinent to Finley's question, we have a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. Um, in terms of SNH's work, we've got examples which we've submitted in the evidence of how we protect and enhance our environment. About 80% of our budget um, goes towards that, including protected areas. But beyond that, we lever in funds from elsewhere. And I think an important message uh, from today is the ability of the organisations in the room to lever in funds. For example, on the Agri-Environment Scheme, um, we contribute a million and a half pounds in 1819. Um, well that, those are our plans, but potentially lever in um, 47 million pounds worth of benefits to the uh, rural economy. Um, in terms of you know, the, the second national outcome that I mentioned, the Central Scotland Green Network is really important, again, um, and we're a contributor um, helping lever in funds to support both an economically sustainable model but green space. Before you uh, complete your question, <coughs> Finlay, uh, Stuart Stevenson wanted to uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, SNH have just helpfully uh, talked about national outcomes, but Visit Scotland didn't. And I wanted to, uh, and I'll be interested generally throughout the session, to what extent the bodies who are here today feel the national outcomes, their existence actually is part of their core planning process and how it directly influences, because there isn't much point in having them if it doesn't, because delivery ultimately, you know, is in the bodies for our interests uh, in the room. So perhaps I'd be interested from Visit Scotland in hearing how that influences. I suspect there may not be much more to say from SNH because they've already uh, covered that. 
Yeah, if, if I can respond on that, um, I have a copy of the, uh, the graphic from, and I'm delighted to share that um, uh, following the meeting of our uh, current corporate plan. Um, and seven of the national outcomes, we have a, a direct involvement in uh, helping to deliver, uh, and the others we, we are indirectly involved as well. So it plays a key part of our planning process, without any question. Um, and it sets the strategic context for the work that we do. Um, and we're able to identify areas right throughout that, 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 that framework uh, that we're able to contribute to. So just to reassure you, it is a, a key part of our planning process and happy to share that. Mark, uh, Mr. Rusko. Um, thank you. I just wanted to come back on, on something that um, uh, SNH had mentioned there, Francesca had mentioned, in relation to Central Scotland Green Network. I mean, obviously, SNH has got a range of tools that it can use in conjunction with partners to grow that natural capital and to grow that impact on the economy. What about a national ecological network? Francesca, if you'd like to ask that and yep. make your other contribution before we go back to Finland. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the question. In terms of a national ecological network, that's um, discussions that are ongoing with the Scottish Government on how exactly that would work. Um, happy to come back to the committee at a, a later stage um, once we've concluded those discussions. Um, just back to um, uh, Stuart's point about national outcomes, um, loads more to say, um, but I, I won't detain the committee. Um, we provided evidence on um, our contribution to national outcomes, both directly and indirectly. Um, but also, like Visit Scotland, it's re uh, reflected in our corporate plan and also uh, will be reflected in our not yet published um, uh, annual report, because as well as seeing the framework of our work within the national outcomes, we also um, lead reporting on three of the indicators in the national performance framework, and we contribute to three others. Uh, so they're very much front of mind. Um, right. Um, Mr Rowley, Alec Rowley first. Uh, on that a question that Visit Scotland um, around working with other public bodies. And it's, it's linked really to the point where you, your submission, you talk about Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund and the £6 million investment. And one of the investments you highlight there is toilets. But in the Highlands right now, the Highland Council has taken a decision to close many, many public toilets. And I just wonder, you know, you're, you're saying it's important to invest in public toilets for, for, for infrastructure, for tourism, and then you have the local authority across the Highlands closing toilets. How does that, <coughs> does that add up? Yeah, Timmy, your, your question is really good, actually, because we're scoring the um, applications this afternoon. In, in the first round, we've had 29 uh, formal applications. Um, I think a couple include uh, toilet provision in some shape or form. Um, I think the important message there is that this is about um, capital infrastructure. There's been a bit of confusion, certainly in the borders, um, around um, revenue being provided to run them. Uh, and that's not the case. That's not the purpose of the fund. I think the point behind the fund is to improve the overall visitor experience, particularly in areas that are under a lot of pressure. Um, and clearly, the, the most important criteria that we'll make the decision on is, is there clear evidence um, that there's a lot of pressure in a particular area with a lot of new visitors arriving and the, the facilities aren't there um, to cope with that, but also that there is a sustainable management in place thereafter once they're created to be managed and kept clean and, and open. Um, and certainly, two that I've been looking at, the evidence is pretty graphic, to be honest. I've had uh, photographic evidence supplied, um, and I think we'll be looking very care carefully at that. I can't comment on the decision by Highland Council to, to close, um, but I, I know that um, there will be a provision within the decision making that we have to, to provide new and additional. Excellent. Thanks very much. I'll now go to Phil Mack. If you just, if you just bear in mind that we're going to health on the next question. Uh, that's very, very clear. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, it was just to make a comment. The ecological framework is something which goes beyond simply those that are involved in either Visit Scotland or Natural Heritage or the Environmental Protection Agency. An ecological framework will actually help and support all of us be much more effective in collaboration and may well be much more effective in helping us answer the question at heart, which is, 
are the sustainable development goals being achieved. So I think if there is something which is really <coughs> clearly picked up early from the committee's response to government, is that type of approach is one which would be much broadly welcomed than just within the, of course, ecology-related organisations. I think, I think you're absolutely right, and that's one of my impressions just of reading the submissions is the, the development, the growing development of, of a collaborative approach across all the agencies in this portfolio. Uh, we'll and I think that's absolutely that vital. Um, um, Finlay, if you would like to uh, finish off um, your question on the circular economy, perhaps, please. Thank you, Convener. There's, there's one very uh, quick, and it, it hopefully requires just a very quick uh, answer to going back to the last uh, section. Um, at previous uh, evidence sessions, I got the impression that uh, the chair of SNH suggested that national outcomes were more easily delivered because of the national parks that were in existence. Would you agree that national parks assist SNH in, in achieving uh, their objective for the national uh, out, for the national outcomes? Uh, I mean, we work. At, sorry. Uh, as, as Visit Scotland, um, we work very closely with the national parks to deliver outcomes in um, the boundaries of those <clears throat> parks, absolutely. Um, we also have responsibility for delivery of those outcomes across the whole of, the whole of Scotland out with the national park areas. But are there any more easily delivered because of the, the national parks framework? Uh, I wouldn't say that they were more easily delivered or less easily delivered we work with you know a range of partners whether it's national parks or out with the national park framework local authorities and other partnership groups okay thanks uh, moving on thank you convener um what i'd like to ask now is is mr gullen uh, regarding i understand there's 18 projects uh being delivered through the circular economy investment fund which was set up back in 2016. Could you give us an idea of what the impact, again, going back to economy and jobs, uh, which are, are maintained because of the high uh, quality natural environment, what role uh, has the Circular Economy Investment Fund played in that? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to come along today. Uh, so the Circular Economy Fund, as you know, uh, is about investing in, uh, I guess, new business, uh, to support our transition here in Scotland to a circular economy so where we use more of the materials more efficiently and effectively uh, here rather than uh, disposing of those materials. Uh, it is seen as a, certainly an, an innovative fund uh, to support new innovative uh, businesses and projects coming forward. Uh, the thrust of it is to improve uh, or sorry, increase uh, the availability of jobs uh, and obviously the turnover of existing businesses who are accessing the fund and also for new startup businesses. So it is very much, I mean, the, the whole aspect of the circular economy, although very much the work that we do at Zerbia Scotland fulfills uh, the ambitions around, well, obviously, outcome six in terms of the environment, we're very much focused on uh, outcome four for the economy and outcome seven around innovation and jobs. So the fund itself, for those 18 projects at the moment, there's a pipeline uh, of other projects, I think I have the number here around, uh, we're working with another 21 uh, applications at this moment who have submitted and, you know, for clarification and final assessment. So there's a huge appetite for those types of projects now, which is about real transformative change here in Scotland. Um, Stuart uh, Stevenson, question. Um, I, I just thought, since the subject of circular economy has come up, uh, it, it, could I just extend that by perhaps asking if public procurement has a, a role to assist in developing uh, a, the, the, the circular economy? And that may be something uh, for Mr. Gillan, but it might be something others would comment on as well, convener. Uh, indeed. Um, Mr. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we see, certainly Zero Waste Scotland, we see the opportunities, that some real opportunities uh, by using public procurement uh, to almost become a pool for new circular economy businesses, particularly around uh, business models like leasing uh, and renting, uh, rather than you know, buying things, uh, products and services. Uh, we could really realign the public procurement uh, to make use of current businesses that we are supporting. And in fact, you know, some of the businesses we are supporting through our circular economy uh, business support services, we're presently supporting over 80 businesses. Uh, some of them could provide services 
uh, and products to the public public sector. But again, uh, it's about how do they how do we work with the procurement professionals to think about whole life costing uh, of products and services in a different way and look at the availability of those these businesses here in Scotland. And that, that's a challenge. It, you know, it's a challenge around all of. Uh, public procurement, working with them, but we have, uh, over the last few years, uh, worked with the public procurement people in government and in local government, uh, train, training, uh, providing training packages on not just sustainable development but circular economy and the opportunities that that are out there, uh, and that's something we're, we're keen to build on. In, in terms, do you have a specific projects in mind? Or is the low-hanging fruit out there that you think could be picked in terms of improving our lot immediately? In that regard, well, there's something that we're actually doing at the moment is doing a, a study across all of the public estate, uh, uh, trying to identify what that the low-hanging fruit would be uh, as we speak with a number of uh, public sector agencies. We have uh, actually got a very good relationship going with uh, NHS at the moment, actually uh, looking at their opportunities. Uh, we did a study with them uh, about a year and a half ago, looking at uh, when they were transferring some of their hospital provision, uh, the availability of assets, so basically the stuff that would naturally possibly have been thrown out in the past, uh, those were assets that could Drugs. have been... Uh, well, I, actually, f more equipment, more surgical equipment and medical equipment, uh, down to beds and desks and all sorts of things in between, uh, but actually how those assets could be utilised back into the, to the uh, health service, uh, but also to other agencies as well. And it is about some of the record keeping, understanding what those assets were. So it was tracking those assets. And on the back of that, we are now working with the NHS uh, more, more widely on the availability of assets, uh, but also looking at the procurement uh, and the opportunities around possibly leasing or renting uh, specialised equipment going forward in a different way. So there's more of a maintenance element to that and uh, increasing the use of innovation rather than just buying things. Right. Excellent. Before we go on to health, one last question from Francesca. Cop on, on the point about the role of other agencies in terms of circular economy and um, how we can, through our own kind of corporate approaches, make sure that we're upholding the principles of sustainability. Um, so, you know, just a, a few points in relation to SNH plastic and single use plastic. We're taking steps to reduce that within our offices and um, undertaking um, uh, an audit of that further to some initial steps, such as trying to ban the use of single-use uh, plastic coffee cups in our main buildings. Uh, we've reduced our carbon emissions uh, by 27% since 2015. Uh, we're looking to work collaboratively with partners, particularly on sharing um, space uh, to you know, enable a kind of more efficient corporate and collective approach. Right. I will now move to uh, question two. Uh, Donald Cameron, if you'd like to talk us through that one, please. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to concentrate on the national outcome of being healthy and active. Um, I think it's we'd all agree that there are clear benefits for health and well-being um, of maintaining a high-quality natural environment. And the Scottish government has suggested that if just one percent of the sedentary population moves to a healthy pathway, uh, then a thousand or so lives would be um, saved and 1.4 billion pounds across the UK would be also saved. But my question is, and I think initially to Phil Mackey, uh, to what extent are these benefits uh, for health and wellbeing actually being realised? That's a very, very good question. Um, I think the, the issue is not so much are there, it's how do we manage to make sure that they are. We clearly have got costs estimates which we've shared with you, which others have looked at, in terms of the financial consequences to the health care system, particularly in Scotland from material that Health Scotland published um, following studies from Oxford University is the £94 million pounds that's actually quoted in, in, in various documents. The degree to which that actually is going to automatically be a cost saving is something that we hope and we can manage to achieve. There are many areas of necessary change. I think what we're hearing 
around the table already is the recognition of the necessary change in opening up the tourist environment, in opening up the natural environment, in looking at the way in which we encourage and support people to become more active of themselves and to therefore take greater control over their own ability to make a contribution. But we have to manage it. We have to achieve that change. We have to ensure that simply ensuring that we've got more active travel, as an example, actually translates into things that people use and support. So I would use that word could rather than would. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because you know, it's all very well to have high ambitions like, well, if we spent, you know, it, it, if we did this, then we could save as much. But actually, it's the practical achievement of that that surely should be our focus. And I think that's what you're. I, I think saying. that's what I'm getting. Yeah. I mean, my my organisation, the Managed Sustainable Health Network that I'm, I'm representing here today, is looking very much at how we achieve that core benefit. Core benefits don't happen automatically. Working together, collaboration, ensuring that many of the agencies around this table are working with health agencies to promote the element of potential well-being that can lead to potential health is an essential first step. But actually, we need to get more savvy. Many of these changes are generational changes, not instant returns on investment. The degree to which we're looking at ageing population now and the comorbidity that they experience is a consequence of activities 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We need to invest not just in the future, but we need to invest in core benefit for the future. Thank you. Can, I, you can, I, can I ask about SNH? Um, I think um, you reported a return on investment in the Central Scotland Green Network um, that's likely to be £6 billion by 2050. Um, do you have any comments to make on the questions that I've asked in terms of health and well-being yeah, about what you can achieve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to repeat the evidence that mm. um, we provided, but we've highlighted in that the National Walking and Cycling Network, um, which we lead, but obviously work with other partners on that and making um, available routes for people to either travel actively um, or to walk, cycle, run, jog, hop. Um, recreationally is a really important part of that, and we've seen that you know, a number of journeys have been generated through the use of the National Walking and Cycling Network. Um, the work that we're doing on green health partnerships in Lanarkshire, Dundee, North Ayrshire and Highland, again, um, it's about making sure that we are, with partners, presenting the opportunities for people to enjoy um, in, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy the green space and the green infrastructure fund um, we've also mentioned. I think just underpinning all of this and perhaps most demonstrated by the work that we're doing with green health partnerships but also work that we do wider is um, just being able to introduce, you know, whether it's via planning, whether it's um, working, you know, with um, Sustrans, for example, on their developments, the concept of green places, green corridors is really important and that placemaking base um, and taking a placemaking approach which is about ensuring that the community are involved in those discussions is really important and I think the same report that you were mentioning um, also shows that having good quality local green space, so that's local green space um, which people can regularly access and use could contribute to saving the NHS £94 million a year as opposed to you know, direct health treatment. Uh, and can I take this opportunity to commend you for leading by example um, this summer by swimming across the Corrie of Wreck and Whirlpool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, that I'm sure will have an impact on uh, the national outcome of being healthy and active. <laughs> Congratulations on behalf Thank of you. us all. For that uh, achievement. Is there anyone else who wants to declare a similar achievement, Mr. Russell? Uh, no, no, <laughs> not, absolutely not. Um, uh, that's rather throwing me, actually. <laughs> um, I'll ask you a question, uh, then we'll come uh, to Mr. Uh, Hughes. I was there. going to ask about a plain question, really, for SNH, which is about whether you think there's enough investment going into our green infrastructure, particularly around uh, our urban areas. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the green infrastructure fund that you've established. Is that enough? And if not, where should the money come from? 
Um, so currently the Green Infrastructure Fund, as you know, covers around 30 disadvantaged communities. Um, we're levering funds from elsewhere to, to support those projects. Um, I think when I was last at, at committee, um, I was challenged on um, the amount of funding that SNH had and, and is it enough? Um, and, you know, no NDPB chief executive is going to turn down funding. Um, but at the moment, we, you know, we're very clear on the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve and how we maximise those and how we lever in funding from elsewhere, including a number of EU so sources. Um, as you've highlighted, it is a zero-sum game. More money for SNH would be less money for, for somebody else, and I'm not sure I'm in a position to say where that less money for somebody else should be. Right. Um, thank you. Um, do you want to, Mr Hughes, if you'd like to say something? Yes, I think... Um, mm. First of all, just, just a little bit of strategic context, because I, I, I do agree with uh, Francesca that, you know, that this idea that investment in, in the stocks, which are our natural capital, our natural environment, our natural ecosystems, um, over time will tend to generate um, healthier flows of benefits. Um, be they health benefits, be they economic prosperity benefits, be they be they social cohesion benefits. So we were very pleased actually that, that in the economic strategy, the government's economic strategy of 2015, there was a commitment there to protecting and enhancing stocks of natural capital, which includes our air, land, water, soil and biodiversity, uh, and that being fundamental to a healthy and resilient economy. And I would go further and say that's fundament uh, fundamentally linked to the delivery of health and well-being benefits. And just to make that real, because that's that's all very well in theory, and I think um, Mr. Cameron's uh, question is, is, you know, where's the evidence for this? If we're going to make this investment, how is it going to pay off? There's a, there's a huge body of research now that, that that tells us that good health into old age is associated with access to biodiverse and uh, and accessible green space. Um, I can give references to the committee uh, if, if, if they so wish, but you know there, there was a recent study actually in Scotland, a Scotland-based study, that reported lower levels of stress and steeper declines in, in, in cortisol secretions, which are associated with a range of health complications in individuals that were living in greener streets and greener, greener areas in our, in our urban areas. And this is particularly um, the case for people living in, 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 in areas of multiple deprivation. The, the effect is higher. So the investment, the, the, the research base is there. The research base, I think, is very strong. The modelling is also very strong. We, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, in, in conjunction with Stirling City Council, um, recently carried out a, a natural capital assessment of the net economic benefits that will, f will flow from investment in green infrastructure in Stirling. Um, and we know that a modest investment there uh, could bring net economic benefits of around 218 million over a period of, of five years. Um, and if, if, for example, a city park in the area was to be, to be constructed, that would bring um, an average of 280,000 in terms of tangible benefits every year to the, to, to the people of Stirling. So there's, so there's lots of modelling, there's lots of research behind this. We probably are at a stage in Scotland at the moment where we are still collecting data to feed back into that evidence base. But, you know, the, the arguments are pretty compelling, I think, for that extra investment. And if I can just maybe say what Francesca maybe couldn't say in that, you know, SNH's budget has been declining now for um, a number of years. Um, it's fallen as a, as a share of the total from 58 million in 2012-13 to an expected budget of 46.2 million uh, this year. So that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty steep decline and that does, I think, impair SNH's ability to um, deliver on a range of these preventative spend measures which actually could save Scotland money and, and, and deliver a whole range of national outcomes, coming back to the point of this session, over a period of time. So I, I, would, I, would, I would possibly go where Francesca can't because of, because of her position and, and actually um, say that, that that investment in SNH is critical to the delivery of some of these national outcomes. Many I'll come on to the, 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 the knock-on impact effects of charities like the Scottish Wildlife Trust, hopefully later on in the session, if I may. Yeah, OK. Um, before you do, um, maybe Mr Rowley have something to say? Just, just pick up on what Mr Hughes said, and, and I agree entirely with the investment and need for that. But an example, I live about, I don't know, a 10-minute walk through Lahore Meadows Country Park, and I was recently in a school, primary school, and asked 
how many of the kids had actually visited the park. And I was amazed by the number that didn't put their hands up. So where's the joined up work in terms of we have this beautiful countryside that certainly I live in a, and surrounded by countryside. Where's the joined up work to get people to actually go out and enjoy the countryside? Because it just doesn't happen, you know, by by people doing it. Do you want me to come back on that, Kamina? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll quickly say that education policy is clearly uh, has huge, huge importance here in mobilising teachers and children to get out into the environment and um, engage in so-called real-world learning, which has all sorts of all sorts of uh, benefits for for the children. So I, I do think there needs to be join up in terms of opportunities for kids to get out every week in, in, into their local natural environment, their local green spaces. Unfortunately, some of these green spaces are of such poor quality that they're not necessarily going to deliver the, um, the outcomes which the, the schools and we are all looking for. So that, that there is some investment required in that local green infrastructure in particular. But uh, I have a half Norwegian daughter. She went to, to school here until she was eight years old and then she went to Norway for the rest of her schooling. She's now 18. And there wasn't a week that went by when she was in school in Norway where she, they didn't get out for at least, a, at least half a day, normally a day a week, into the natural environment. Um, and there's no such thing as bad weather in Norway, it's just bad clothes, so they went out every single week. Um, and that has had tremendous benefits, I think, for her and, uh, and her peer group. If I may indulge in a personal Many thanks. story. Um, I'm going to indulge myself now. Um, I'm just asking him if he wants to talk about crime reduction and, and mental health improvement. Um, sequestration, just um, flood damage around these things with, uh, with regard to it's got the Central Scotland Green Network, the benefits, just to, to broaden the, the conversation out a little to, to try and get a handle on the other benefits as well. Uh, and Francesca, you were wanting in anyway, so... Yeah, um, I was just going to comment on the point about joined up thinking in relation to young people accessing green space. Um, absolutely agree. Um, really important. Uh, we've got a network of national nature reserves and men, much of the work of our staff on um, our NNRs is about engaging with primary and secondary schools locally to encourage visits. Um, there are some barriers to that. Um, curricular time, um, transport, um, and we try and overcome that and provide as much support as we can but um, it, it can be challenging uh, for some schools in some areas. Um, Recognising that, we've looked at other ways to engage young people in local uh, green space. So, for example, the Learning in Local Green Space project supports 100 schools um, in disadvantaged areas and encourages pupils to learn in local green space um, and ensure local visits um, and regular visits up to 2020 and we have just launched the outdoor learning in nature fund in march which again is to support young people uh, to have um, regular outdoor learning experiences and 43 applications were received it was massively oversubscribed and we funded um, at this point around 16 worth 410,000, and we have a, a second round um, later in the year um, in terms of um, your question, convener, in relation to other areas of benefit, we talked about health, um, and primarily we've focused on physical health, but mental health as well, I think is increasingly um, important. And again, the, the study that we, um, uh, that the Scottish Government Rural and Environment Science Analytical Services conducted identified mental health benefits as a key factor in um, the central green network as well as um, kind of justice pr crime prevention benefits um, I visited a project in the borders um, which was actually run by the the John Muir Trust um, um, which we're in partnership with which is obviously outside the CSGN but as an example this was a project which was working with people with alcohol and drug dependency issues and um, from um, the central belt um, took them to the borders and they were involved in a planting scheme and the feedback from that particular project was that um, the rates of you know re um, 
um, recommitting to alcohol or drug dependency were much lower than other programs and they've the evidence suggested that it was the outdoors that was the crucial factor in these better um, better rates of success brilliant thanks very much uh, mr Mackey Phil Mark. very briefly the evidence in relation to well-being green space blue space the degree to which that impacts in relation to support for people with mental distress absolutely clear no question about it whatsoever the degree to which we are opening up access to help and support people in a much broader range of social and economic backgrounds to make use of that green space and blue space as i think as mr Rowley has already highlighted uh, an issue in itself we do need to recognize and why i brought up the issue of an ecological framework is the degree to which we focus on the individual behaviors of an, a person to be health seeking has to be set in the context of their social economic and cultural circumstances we've talked this morning around the 94 million potential cost saving attributable to physical inactivity that represents 17 percent of the total costs to the nhs of the diseases which are resulting from physical inactivity the 83 percent is therefore out there somewhere in other determinants of health and it is both within the environmental injustices, the social and cultural injustices, and maintaining the economic sustainability to reduce economic you know, um, problems that people experience, that we also have to look at to improve health, particularly in relation to mental health as well as physical health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Gilliland. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess this is where I'd refer to our uh, work around litter and fly tipping, uh, tackling uh, those issues, particularly in relation to people's, uh, people's health. Uh, I think there is a emerging uh, work now uh, and evidence around the impact of uh, well, litter and fly tipping and general uh, untidiness of where people stay in terms of their ment mental well-being. I mean, obviously our, our work has very much focused on the economic impacts of litter and fly tipping in terms of the cost of clearing up and the economic impact of, uh, of, of potentially putting off tourism and a uh, degree of uh, inward investment. So that's been our focus. But through our work, uh, there's a growing sort of sense that, that is, it is impacting on, on people's lives as well. So I guess the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, certainly with government in terms of the, the wider strategy around tackling litter, so uh, adopting the new code of practice, which has just gone through parliament uh, this year, which puts more of an emphasis on waste prevention uh, or sort of litter prevention uh, rather than just simply cleaning the stuff up uh, and that is about engaging with people uh, in communities uh, across Scotland uh, on measures to, to reduce the impact of that. Obviously we can cite previous work that we've been involved in in terms of uh, adoption of the single-use carrier bag levy to reduce it and currently working with uh, the Scottish Government on modelling a deposit return system for Scotland uh, which again will tackle uh, elements of the, of the litter stream. So these are all really important things, not just in terms of the economic opportunities, in terms of materials that could be recycled and put back into productive use uh, and business opportunities, but they are part and parcel of making uh, the lives of individuals here in Scotland much better. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, uh, people behave completely differently in a litter-free environment to one that's overcrowded with litter, from my own observations. Um, Johnny, if you'd like to... I think, you, I think you, you asked a question about flooding, did you not? What did you say? Did you ask a question about yes, flooding? Yes, I did, yeah. And nobody answered it, so I'll try, I'll try and say something about that, because I do think this is important in, in, the, in, in, the, in the context, actually, of a lot of the, the general duties which have been passed in this Parliament in various acts over, over the period of its existence, um, not actually being followed through and implemented properly, and one of those was the natural flood management duty in the wildlife environment, uh, the Water Environment and Water Services Act, I think of 2002, um, when the environment sector was very pleased to see a, a natural flood management duty included in that act. But it, it just simply hasn't, hasn't been delivered in terms of the green infrastructure investment in towns and cities and also investment in resilient landscapes. Um, I'm thinking particularly about peatland restoration, forest landscape restoration. In more recent years, yes, we've, we've, we've started to catch up on peatland restoration, and that's very welcome. It's a very welcome move. Um, but really, it's not been embedded. This idea of natural flood management um, has not really been embedded in, in, in the budget, 
um, an investment hasn't been made to the extent we are st still now seeing river flooding costs to the Scottish economy of around about 32 million a year, estimated 32 million a, a year annualised over a period of time. So, um, you know, if, if, if we can um, think of, think of uh, restructuring the budget in a way that more investment in green infrastructure is made both within towns and cities and their catchment areas, uh, I think that would be um, money well spent. It's a very low hanging fruit. It's a very cost, of effect, cost effective way of reducing the impacts of flooding and the costs of flooding. Okay, right. Uh, thank you very much for all those contributions and that question. And a final contribution from Phil on, before we move just to the next question. I was just going to pick up on the question of flooding. We should not underestimate the health consequences of flooding. The degree to which mental health is lost as a result of loss of place, the degree to which individuals may well be put at risk, particularly if they're older people. The water of Leith flooding a few years in Covington showed just how risky that can be for older people. We actually do need to recognise that in many of the day-to-day -day work of investment of capital expenditure, the health indirect consequence of what's currently happening is something that is important, as important as future investment and preventative work. And with climate change marching on, I couldn't agree with you more. And having sat in the flooding bill some 10 years ago, with which we could refer back to that evidence, the evidence we heard at that time about the, the consequences of, of flooding and the effect on mental health particularly um, are well documented. Uh, Angus, uh, Angus MacDonald, if you'd like to take the next question, please. Thanks, um, convener. Um, I'm keen to... I'm keen to further explore the, the, the impact of budget reductions, which we've, we've already uh, touched on. Um, so can I ask the panel um, where you see uh, the, the greatest risks of future budget reductions having a, a negative impact on uh, national outcomes? And maybe, for example, by way of an, an opener to the, to the discussion on this uh, specific issue, uh, what are your views on the risks of reducing spend on enforcement regulations. Who would like to pick up on Angus's question from the panel? Johnny. Johnny. Thank you. Um, thank you again. I'll, I suppose I'll start with uh, a quote from the, the European Commission on this, who, who have said that investment in green infrastructure is a catalyst to economic growth. It's usually cheaper than traditional grain infrastructure, creates sustainable jobs and brings great returns on investment. Um, and you know, so any 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 cuts to the investment in the kind of fundamental health of our environment will have negative impacts on on, on the flows that we that we uh, achieve from that investment. Um, I'll go back to December 2017 um, when when this committee received an update on Scotland performance in terms of the, the national outcomes and the scorecard. Uh, the scorecards that were then received, um, only one of the 11 examined um, had none of the indicators as assessed as improving, and that was the, uh, that was the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee portfolio in, in effect. So we're, we're not achieving those, those environmental outcomes, and, we're, and by, by, by extension, we're not achieving the, um, the positive services and benefits that we, that, that we gain from, um, from, from a healthy and natural environment. So I think that's, that's the context in, 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 in which we're operating. Um, in terms of the biggest, the biggest impacts um, of, of not achieving that, I think to, to an extent they, they lie with the risks to, posed by climate change um, in the wider rural environment. We need to make our wider rural environment much more resilient to the impacts of climate change. The National Ecological Network has been, has been mentioned. I think investment in a national, natural, uh, a national ecological network is essential for that climate change adaptation. And similarly, a, a resurrection really of the, the land use strategy, which has been put into abeyance for, for several years, but you know, hopefully we'll now see something of a resurgence in the coming years. So these, these are strategic priorities which have been identified by government and haven't been followed through, and there will be consequences if we don't, if, if we don't make that investment now. Similarly, um, I think the, the biggest other priority where we, where we will see um, negative issues emerging is, is a lack of investment in green infrastructure within towns and cities and peri-urban environments, and getting the planning right, um, not just in terms of new green infrastructure for new developments, but the retrofitting of green infrastructure into our towns and cities. And, and ensuring that people have regular access 
to, to nature for all the health benefits and social cohesion benefits it brings. So those were two of the big ones for me. The, 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 the big investments in rural landscapes um, to, 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 to better make them more resilient for climate change impacts and the investment of green infrastructure in towns and cities, nature-rich investment, uh, uh, investment in towns and cities, which uh, I think could bring substantial benefits. Thank you. Francesca, would you like to talk about the threat of budget reductions? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, in terms of um, kind of budget reductions, I mean, Johnny's already outlined the fact that SNH budget has reduced um, by 25% in the last five years. Um, uh, our greatest asset within SNH is our people, so we have seen uh, a, a marked reduction in. Um, the number of uh, staff working in SNH, and that does impact on particularly our local engagement piece. Um, what I would say is that it also impacts on the grants that we're able to give to other bodies, such as SWT, RSPB, um, NTS, and others. But what we're trying to do, because we recognise um, that in terms of the medium-term financial position that things are unlikely to improve is to look for different ways of working. So whilst some of our funding um, to other bodies via framework grants has decreased, uh, we're looking to establish funding streams which are based on uh, agreed and shared outcomes and have a more challenge fund approach, hopefully to lever in more funding from other sources. We're also very conscious um, that the public sector is not the only source of funding uh, for environmental issues, and I'm sure the committee is familiar with the, where the Green Grants Went in Scotland uh, report published by the Environmental Funders Network last year, which showed um, that uh, Scotland is not keeping uh, pace with perhaps other parts of the UK in terms of the leverage from trusts and other sources of that type into the environment. Um, and within SNH, um, we found that, you know, kind of really interesting report and have discussed that with SE Link um, and want to do some further work on how we can jointly think about um, diversification of funding sources into the sector as a whole. OK, thank you very much. Mark, do you want to... Uh, is it a, a question, then, of creating discrete funds for investment in landscape or, you know, urban green infrastructure? Or is it about using the existing subsidy regime, say, for agriculture more effectively? Because I think you mentioned earlier on this is, is a zero-sum game. If you argue for more money, it's less money somewhere else. But, you know, hey, there's a lot of money floating around the system at, at the moment, and it's being spent in different ways. So how do we, how do we get better outcomes from that yeah I'd, I'd really like to answer that one because you're absolutely right um the scottish wildlife trust last last year produced as a result of the brexit vote a, a model for a blueprint for government policy that how the common agricultural policy might be delivered in scotland around about 15 percent of the spend in the, in the in the current scottish rural development program actually goes to agri-environment spend so effectively green infrastructure and uh, in, in environmental outcome spend. Uh, that's a tiny percentage, and if we could um, up that percentage significantly, in fact, I would say let's, let's, let's use that money for public, public benefits, then we could start to see a turnaround in some of these indicators that we're, we're seeing as amber and red in the, in the Scotland performance framework related to the, to the environment. So, so absolutely redeployment of existing budgets, which actually don't have a policy purpose in, 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 in some circumstances. Um, Francesca mentioned the, the Where the Green Grants Go report. The statistics there are pretty shocking, actually. Only 1.9 million a year between the years of, of 2012 to 16 went into Scotland from trusts and foundations from a UK level. Uh, and that includes everything for, from climate to landscape to marine work. Um, we have 56% of the coastline in Scotland, but only get 3% of the total environmental grant funding in the UK um, from, from trusts and foundations. For climate, it's even worse. 0.4% of the UK total comes to Scotland. So these are pretty stark figures. England and Wales are getting 20 times the funding that we get, and organisations like my own are getting 20 times uh, the, the, the funding um, than we are in Scotland. Um, and this, 
this, this, uh, one of the most important points I want to make today is that the knock-on impacts of reductions in, in budgets from, from SNH obviously, obviously have an impact on charities like the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Le leverage is, 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 it means that we, we cannot use that, that funding for leverage to access these, these grants, sometimes from down south. Why do you think that's happening, that there's a much reduced... I think, well, it's only six of the 41 trusts, um, foundations that actually give to environmental work are actually based in Scotland. I think that's one reason. We are addressing this. I'm going down to London next week to give a presentation to environmental funders on this very issue. But I wanted to come back to this point but about six leverage. six over 41 we, is still 15 per cent, roughly. Um, your figures were much lower than 15 per cent in terms of the funding we're allocated. But there's, 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 there's a leverage issue in, in the sense if we... As, a, as, as an environmental charity, and it's, it's the same really for the environmental charities across the board, um, don't actually have a, a secure pot of money in which to match fund against some of those, some of those um, pots that we could bid for down south. We simply will not be in a position to do that because they don't fund 100%. The intervention rates can be as low as 40, 50%. So without that, without that um, unrestricted income in order to match those funds, we can't actually pursue that funding. So that's less money into Scotland the less money that um, is, is transferred from agencies such as SNH to, to charities um, means effectively less money into Scotland from those sources. So I, I think that's an important point because I don't think it's often realised, yeah. right. that okay. kind of lack of leverage. I'm going to go point. to Ian now. Yep. So uh, I, I guess thinking about the recycling uh, sector, I guess, and the circular economy, I think, I think we're really in a... In a bit of a, a transition, I guess, from uh, where we've been before, particularly in Scotland. We've, we've, we've really attracted uh, a lot of interest in what we're doing in Scotland from uh, demonstrating an ambition or certainly broadcasting our ambition uh, around the circular economy and making funding and other support packages available, not just through the likes of Zero Scotland, but through other uh, agencies as well. That has attracted a lot of interest and not just for homegrown businesses and communities as well. Uh, but from outside of Scotland, that that is money and investment has 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 helped that. Uh, but it's all to some extent coming to fruition now, with a lot of a lot of uh, greater awareness, both from the public, and we can talk about Blue Planet and the impact of plastics on communities and people wanting to take action, and businesses as well, not just on plastic. But the idea of the circular economy now is a is a global trend. Everybody recognises that, and other countries are are one looking to Scotland as a leader, uh, but also identifying their own strategies and own uh, infrastructure that they require. So now for Scotland to kind of pull back, I guess, from commitment to this field, I think is, you know, it would be counterproductive. Now is the time to realise all of that ambition, all of the learning, all of the things that we've learned about investment and what we need, the infrastructure, the requirements, uh, the evidence base that we've built up. Now is the time to kind of push through uh, and really make uh, uh, realise that ambition that we've had. Uh, so I guess, and also the fact that other countries, to some extent, are catching up. They are looking to Scotland, and they are already developing their own funding packages and their own support packages. A lot of it very much aligned to what we've been doing in Scotland, and they are they are now seeing these opportunities in their own countries. So for us to kind of not see that as our you know journey in terms of fulfilling that commitment. Uh, I think might be counterproductive. Uh, having said that, I think uh, there are things that we could be doing with public finance in terms of levering uh, continual investment from producers and other manufacturers of products and things through extended producer responsibility. Uh, there is a, the other, other aspect of this is as this becomes more mainstream in terms of the, the, the opportunities around investment, uh, particularly with our partnerships with the likes of Scottish Enterprise and Highlander Enterprise and, and the new body in the south of Scotland, you know, but their, their budgets are under pressure as well. So as they are now coming to the table, realising that they can bring their services and support to this uh, endeavour, uh, they're, they're under pressure as well. So it is, it is a really great time, you know, to realise from where I say five years ago, we were trying to get people to take action. Now people want to take action. Businesses, communities, individuals recognise the importance of this, of this work and really want to, to, to be able to be supported. The other point uh, uh, Angus made was about uh, enforcement. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, colleagues at SEPA are much more aligned to issues around criminal activity in, in recycling and, and waste management. Uh, but we do need a robust regulatory and enforcement framework. Uh, if we don't, it is completely unattractive for investment. It is a 
a robust or Pardon? No, I think we have a robust. But I think, sorry, it was the point about enforcement. If we if we don't enforce uh, the robust framework that we have, uh, it is it is still waste. You know, unfortunately, <coughs> it still is seen uh, in the shadows sometimes. And so, if if we're talking to people who are in, investors, uh, private sector investors who have other opportunities, renewables and other things in Scotland, uh, waste if it's not seen as a level playing field with a robust regulatory uh, sorry, enforcement framework around it, then it is less attractive. So it is something that I think we really do need to recognise. Legislation is fine. We just yeah, you, sorry, you I didn't, need I, better yeah. enforcement rather yeah, no, than I more legislation. Was, I think the question was if we start to uh, reduce funding for enforcement, uh, right. that, would be the impact, that could be the impact uh, if we are seen, if we are not able to enforce that regulatory framework that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and support certainly the criminal uh, support the tackling of the criminal activity mm -hmm. in the waste industry, which I know that SEPA uh, is very much focused on. Then, yeah, it will it will be the detriment of inward investment. Excellent. Right, let's bring Angus back in. An appropriate time to bring him back. In. Well, it was just to to, to further explore that, um, and I'm just curious if any other members of the panel have a view on uh, what Ian Gullens just covered with regard to um a reduced spend on uh, enforcement of regulations if anybody has a view on that Francesca you seem the obvious person. Uh, yeah thank you um I mean in terms of the regulatory environment in which we operate um that's largely derived from EU directives uh, we have a commitment from the uh, Scottish government that you know as we move through the EU exit process the standards of environmental regulation will um, not be diminished compared to uh, the framework in which we're currently operating. And from our perspective, that's very welcome because ensuring that we have those high standards which will be import, uh, enforced is, is important in the maintenance of um, our natural assets, our natural capital, and you know, all the, you know, the, the things that we started this conversation talking about, uh, the landscapes that we um, enjoy so much in Scotland. Finally, on this question, Alec. That question again about the the working together in terms of local government, who has the biggest function, I would suggest, in terms of environmental health and and so on. And it's if you take Edinburgh Council, I've noticed recently, I think they have put a five pound charge on for collecting green waste. You've seen other local authorities, five where I where I come from, uh, have put a They've, they've closed the recycling centres X amount of days to save money. Uh, and then you have charges for different uplifts, which all the evidence would suggest leads to more fly tipping, uh, more pressure. Would you agree with that? And the question would be, what kind of collaboration do you have with local authorities in these areas when they are making these decisions and the impact that they have? And, and one final question in terms of legislation, uh, because you talked earlier about, about food waste, for example, and yeah, there's behavioural change and we need to do stuff there, but is there a need to start looking at how we regulate? Uh, and for example, the, the three for one, two for one, three for two, buys, etc., that, that there is evidence that, that that can lead to food waste? Mr. Gilland, you have the final answer on this question. Yeah. Okay, a few things. Uh, so we do uh, we work uh, obviously directly one to one with uh, all councils in Scotland on uh, supporting uh, changes to their recycling services. So we are in touch with a number of uh, authorities, uh, and we do understand again the financial pressures that they are under. Uh, and obviously, we have in the past provided a degree of funding support for uh, investment in new infrastructure, particularly around food waste collections over the last uh, five or six years. And we're currently supporting a number of councils who are, uh, who are adopting the charter for the, the Scotland-wide charter for recycling services to, to kind of bring them all into an alignment uh, in terms of a common uh, system approach. Uh, so we are we are well aware of the individual pressures that they have. Uh, but and, and I think that comes back to the point about funding. So it's not just about local government or central government. It's how we can look at lever and other types of funding, produce, producer responsibility, and, and bring together a different package of support, support for local authorities. Because absolutely, I mean, the question is how do you know recycling is the right thing to do? There's loads of evidence now. You know, nobody's going to deny that you know keeping stuff out of landfill or disposal is the right thing to do. There are 
economic savings to be made for councils and, and individual householders, but there's huge economic benefit for repurposing these materials here in Scotland. We just need to understand how can we afford to extract them, I guess, out of the waste stream to make this thing work, because the benefits far outweigh the investment that we need to put in at the beginning. But that, that is of something that we need to think, talk about. So who funds that? Is it down to local authorities? Is it down to central government? Or is there a mix here? And what is the role of other private sector agencies involved in this, uh, particularly around producer responsibility, to, to shape that going forward? And that's something, obviously, it's more about policy, I guess. Uh, but that's about what that we've obviously in, in hand with Scottish government and colleagues. Uh, because, yeah, at the current state, local authorities are under those types of pressures and the systems that they're, the systems that they're going to, I'm not saying Edinburgh in any, in, as an example, but I think councils would possibly admit they're not putting out the services that they would like to put out. It's simply about affordability. So how can they afford to do the things that they want to do to capture all these economic opportunities? Uh, food waste. I think, yeah, there is, uh, there is probably more we could be doing about food waste, but a, a lot of the retailers uh, have actually shifted away from two for one and three for five and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there is much more of a growing participation by retailers and what they're putting out for people uh, in terms of discounting. Uh, they are much more involved in, in that system, I guess, in trying to help reduce food. But there is a lot more we could be doing, uh, particularly around education and working with consumers or citizens around uh, the food that they, they buy and, and uh, how they use it back in the home. Uh, it's not so much the two for one, it's what they get do with the stuff when they get home or they leave it in the fridge and they don't they forget about it. So I don't know if it is legislation, I think that is a real behavioural change. Uh, you know, somebody said to me that, you know, we need all of the positive impact that came on the back of the David Attenborough programme, we need something similar on, on food waste, something, you know, we need a kind of brown planet uh, type of approach. So something that really captures everybody's imagination about the impact of food waste, because it is, in terms of carbon, far more significant than the issues about plastic, but I'm not, not dismissing the impacts of plastic. Uh, that was a final question, sorry. I think, I think you've done very well. Okay, um, and I think we'll move it now to the next question, which I've um, volunteered to ask, and I should, declare an interest, I should have declared an interest a long time ago in this session as a, as a farmer. Um, but um, the, so the question is, how well do we understand the links between where we allocate public money in the budget and the impact on national outcomes? And as part of the new budget process, what can we do to improve our understanding of how budget deci decisions affect these outcomes? Because we're moving to a much more outcomes-driven um, reality. Who would like to pick up on that one? The impact and the, the, the clarity between how we allocate public money and the impact on national outcomes. Thank you. I'll start, um, and again, I'll try not to repeat um, what our, evident, our written evidence says and what I've said previously. In terms of the national outcome framework, and I think there was a, a question from um, Stuart Stevenson earlier about how real is it. Um, and the national outcome framework has been running since 2007. I think it is very real for public bodies. And if you were to read any of the kind of corporate plans around the table, you would see um, that they're reflected. And we have a duty to um, report um, through our various mechanisms on that. In terms of the understanding um, of where our budget goes on national outcomes, again, I think, you know, certainly within SNH, um, we can give you figures. Um, we, you know, for example, we think around 80% of our budget contributes to um, the We Value, Enjoy, Protect and Enhance Environment outcome, which includes our work on protected areas, habitats and species, um, pl planning for great places work. The question that you've asked, I think, is about what are the long-term impacts on each of these outcomes? And we can track through the national indicators, as Johnny's um, mentioned, how those are changing. The cause and effect between the spend and the um, impact on indicators is, is much more detailed work. You've already referred to one report which does show um, uh, some rates of return around the central Scotland Green Network. But I think we would, you know, if we wanted to answer that question, you know, you know 
proper scientific way, we would need to do um, some further longitudinal analysis to deliver that. We have a lot of information on outputs, how many people were supporting, what we're doing for nature. I'm sure, you know, um, um, Phil, Ian, Johnny, um, uh, and Riddle could do the same um, in terms of how we're supporting kind of different parts of um, Scotland's economic and social firmament, if you like. But we, I, I suggest we would need to take, to answer your question properly, quite a, a rigorous um, analytical approach. Maybe a piece of work for a university somewhere sometime. Um, um, Phil? Just to, to pick up, actually, on, on, on that point, financial votes actually are very often associated with current activity, which includes an element of preventative activity. We rarely cost for future return. That's why Invest to Save approaches, whether they're in the NHS, whether they're within uh, waste management systems, whether they're in natural heritage investment, it doesn't really matter. What you're doing is you're trying to invest for a future potential cost uh, response. Um, back in the day when Sir Derek Wanless worked for UK Treasury in looking at the impacts of preventative spend on the NHS, he recognised very early on that the degree to which you actually have to budget for current activity as well as for future potential prevention and see a taper towards the two. So you invest in your preventative work, you invest in your current activity, over time, you should see a convergence between those two funding streams. If that is true for health, I suspect it may be true for other areas of public sector funding, even without accepting there may be additional funding sources in the system. We need to look at models for the longer term and actually be more sophisticated in understanding the finances attributable to those future outcomes. That is a work for academics, but let's not forget, at the moment, we have to estimate our current consequences of how much physical inactivity costs the NHS because we haven't got a direct measure of that. Our current systems do not allow us to even cost for our collaboration. My Director of Strategy in Health Scotland is the Deputy Chair of Scottish Natural Heritage. It's absolutely fantastic the degree to which we can actually cost for our staffing contributions to the collaborative work we're currently undertaking is an exercise in its own right. I think we need greater sophistication to reflect the collaborations that are necessary to deliver the type of, of goals that are being given to us to deal with. Yes, very interesting. Um, Ian? Well, I, I, I apologise, I don't, I, I don't really have an answer to the question. I mean, I, I see it as a bit more of a detailed um, exercise. Uh, I think so slightly uh, anecdotally, I guess, for us, and it builds on the point that uh, Phil's making about collaboration. I think, I think the success, the success of the last year and a half around these, this outcome approach for us is, is identifying our work across those eleven outcomes. What, what, what are we doing to ensure that we are aligned to them? And what that actually does is it forces people to think, obviously, in the organisation, but identifies new partnerships, new collaborations with people like the health service. Uh, not just in the obvious spaces, but it identifies other organisations who are possibly more aligned to some of these, uh, but then we can work with them and, 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 and share, share that uh, activity in a way that is, is more efficient and effective uh, and, and builds that collaborative thing. So in some respects, that's, that's something at the moment that is really pulling through to our work. It's certainly something that um, over my lifetime I've been involved in quite a few collaborative things and I know the experts in the rural field are, are SAOS um, under the leadership of, of James Graham and since they've been doing it for a while they might have a way of measuring the impact uh, on the businesses and the, the projects that they run in a collaborative way so it might be worth somebody just looking at that um, in terms of measuring outcomes and value of collaborative approach. Um, I think we have a second go on that, which is just to say, and I think in terms of all of the evidence you've heard today, um, 
there's a, been a really strong theme about all of us tackling um, the root causes rather than the symptoms and you know the evidence that's been presented in, in written form certainly from SNH and from the evidence I've read from um, other colleagues the work that we're doing together to try and for example um, get green space in at the start of conversations in development via a kind of placemaking and place standards model um, the work that we're doing um, collaboratively with the NHS on how our goals from SNH align with the N uh, NHS's and so on and so forth, I think do show that there has been a, a shift towards that more preventative approach um, and invest to save now, but we're not going to be able to track the benefits of that for some time. But I think what we can see in the, you know, the um, Central Scotland Green Network research, I think is probably one of the best examples at the moment, is that there are going to be a number of benefits across different fields, um, which means that we feel we've got a clear rationale for continuing with that preventative um, approach and collaborative approach from this point onwards. I'm going to bring in Mark at this point, um, Mark, because that was sort of around yeah. what you equipped. Oh, I beg your pardon, I was going to bring in Johnny first before I brought in Mark. Uh, thank you for reminding I'll, me. I'll, I'll be Johnny. extremely brief and just say, you know, you can, you can model and you can use case studies, and the, you know the modelling would suggest that people living in in biodiverse natural near biodiverse natural green spaces are between 1.37 and 1.6 times more likely to have better health. But we won't know um, until we've followed through on the delivery of some of our national outcomes whether that actually you know the, the model will will play out in Scotland in exactly that way. So it, it is a bit of a leap of faith making a pre preventative investment spend. I would say that the the sustainable development goals are under, uh, undergoing a progress review at the moment um, at, at a kind of global level and different countries are obviously trying to track the impact um, as they as they implement their various sustainable development goals in their countries that actually might be a very useful um, resource for scotland when that when that is published um, to see how other countries are getting on because some of those sdgs are very similar to our national outcomes in fact they've been mapped across to our national outcomes yeah. OK, Mark, Nick, over to you. Yeah, we, we started to discuss the preventative spend agenda and, you know, there was a number of um, examples that have been raised throughout this morning. But I, I suppose my question is, you know, we're now, you know, seven years on from the Christie Commission. Um, you know, the first budget, I think, that was set after the Christie Commission had a particular allocation around preventative spend within it. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering, you know, where are we in, in Scotland? I mean, I look at Wales and they have a Future Generations Act and there's a, a requirement under that act to consider preventative spend. What do we have in Scotland? We have a budget process here right now, which we're discussing this morning. We're in the middle of this. Uh, what, is that adequate? Um, what are the kind of models we should be bringing forward to assess preventative spend and to build that into budgets? Uh, are, there, are there other structures we could learn from elsewhere? Um, I know, you know Phil Mackey's already mentioned some of the potential modelling that organisations could use. Uh, I'm trying to drill down as to what it is that will can, uh, can unlock this, because it seems like we've been talking about preventative spend for a long time, and yet it's not transparent, and I'm sure every organisation here has got good examples of where they're doing some preventative work, but I don't get a sense of how much you're, you know, what percentage of your own budgets you're putting into this agenda. Can I throw that open? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Like, shall I kick off for a change? Yeah, give give the uh, statutory agencies a break. Um, so, I actually think there's a good a good example of of, of where we're, we're beginning to do this, or the Scottish government is beginning to do this um, through the mainstream of climate change through several portfolios of government. Um, maybe it's not gone far enough, but using the, the 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 Times model, you know, we now at least are beginning to try and understand how, how different portfolios across government and their budgets will impact or not in a negative or positive way on, on climate change targets. Now, we could do the same. Um, so if we, could, if we could take a strategic approach to mainstreaming expenditure um, to achieve the environmental outcomes of, of healthy stocks of natural capital across Scotland, and, and uh, within, within budgets right across the portfolios, I think, using that kind of model, that times type model, but for, for wider environmental outcomes, I think we'd be getting somewhere. There is um, something called a, um, a mainstreaming environment into budget processes checklist that the United Nations have produced, 
which I would commend to the committee. Um, it's a one-pager. Um, there, it literally is a checklist, and I think that would be a pretty good start. I'm not going to kind of read it out, but that would be a that would be a, a, a pretty good start. You know, it, it includes questions like has has the finance ministry uh, included environmental or climate sustainability as a priority for public expenditure in its budget call line to to other ministries, um, and have projects undergone some kind of screening to assess their costs and benefits. So that's a kind of natural capital type valuation. Um, before budgets are then allocated. So it's, it's much more of an evidence-based way of, uh, of, of allocating funds. Thanks. Francesca? Yeah, I was going to pick up on the, the natural capital approach that um, um, Johnny and I had already mentioned as, as a key tool um, in being able to uh, model the benefits over a long period of nature to you know, Scotland PLC, um, and that covers, you know, as I said earlier, a range of sectors, whether it be renewable energy, food and drink, tourism, agriculture. Um, in terms of, you know, I think maybe the question you're asking is what evidence do we have that this is working and therefore can we base as, you know, the, the people around the room base our kind of funding decisions with confidence on a preventative approach and I think if I look at all of the work that SNH does and has been presented to you then it contributes to a range of the national outcomes uh, and in that way by that you know hitting multiple um, buttons if you like I think you can demonstrate that it is going to have a, a cost saving um, elsewhere, you know, we've talked about justice, we've talked about mental health, etc. I think the other point, just to pick up on something Johnny said, was international comparisons. Uh, we, you know, Finland, for example, has done a lot of work on assessing the impact on preventative spend. So, you know, I think widening some of our horizons to look at international comparisons would be helpful, and through those comparisons, that gives me the confidence in terms of our spend. I think that each agency was already doing that as part of their sort mm -hmm. of daily bread and seeing where they yeah, might improve what they are doing. Yeah. But I think it's worth very much worth saying. Mark? So, so that, that describes the generality of, of an organisation like SNH's approach, and I understand that. But how, do, how as a politician would I be able to drill down into a particular area? So take non-native invasive species, for example. How would I have a knowledge that the investment that's being put into tackling that as a preventative spend issue is actually going to deliver at the end of the day? Uh, whether the budgets that are being allocated with your organisation and others is actually going to result in, in an outcome where the problem will be solved or at some point it will become worse because we failed to take action early on. It, there isn't the, perhaps lack of clarity on that. So how do you, how do you, do you do that analysis? Do you present that kind of analysis? Dendrums, yes, and uh, giant rhubarb, Japanese rhubarb. Um, it, we do. So, in terms of, and you know, it, it's a shame in a way that um, this evidence session is taking place before the publication of our latest annual report, because I think that would set out, and when it is published, you'll be the first to have it. Um, will you know does set out some of that cause and effect. Um, without wanting to go into the detail of our internal monitoring arrangements, and the annual report gives the overview of that. In terms of all of our um, corporate targets within SNH, which include those national indicators that I've already mentioned, for which um, we are the lead or which, to which we contribute, we analyse those both as senior leadership team and um, a board on a quarterly basis. We look at progress. Um, we look at where the impact of our work is um, supporting those corporate outcomes. So we, you know, as, as the convener said, in a sense, that's built into our day-to-day -day work to make sure that we're monitoring the progress against our corporate targets, which includes um, the, the national outcomes. OK, thank you. Finlay, did you want to come in? to look at a lot about cost savings, preventative spending <clears throat> and the impact on future budgets. But uh, there's been a perceived shift um, within SNH towards <clears throat> supporting more green urban plans, whatever. Is there a conflict of interest or a, a conflict 
uh, and pressures on the budget with regards to actually the other remit of SNH, which is to, to ensure um, biodiversity and protection of um, habitats and whatever, because we all know there's, there's habitats where there's not a lot of voters. Um, there might be a crested newt in the middle of Sutherland that costs an awful lot to protect. How, how do you balance that when it comes to um, looking for funding? <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, in, I'll come on to the looking for funding bit, um, if I can sort of deal with our <coughs> priorities, and, and this was obviously a feature of um, the, you know, the last committee appearance that both Mike and I attended, and then previously I attended with Alan Hampson. <coughs> In terms of our budget, we're able to, uh, to apportion that um, across the national outcomes. And I've, as I've said earlier, 80% of our budget is contributing to we enjoy, protect and enhance our environment. So that includes the statutory responsibilities to which you're alluding. Um, in terms of an urban-rural split, and this is based on our project budget, uh, because I think there was a sense at the committee the last time I was here that you know, we'd, we'd gone all urban and deprived and rural didn't matter. 88% um, of our project funding is uh, for rural projects and 12% is for urban funding. And a lot of that is levered in from EU um, sources. In terms of biodiversity, and that, is, I mean, that is our raison d'etre. And one of, the, um, you know, one of the issues that the board is very clear that they would like SNH to um, look to, to do in the future is be seen more as leaders on, on biodiversity, on improving nature, if that's you know, the more accessible language um, than perhaps we've been seen to be doing in the past. We were the first country to report against the Aichi targets. We've reported against the 2020 route map. Uh, so I think you know, we've got a lot of activity and a lot of reporting um, in place to, um, to support that the work that we're doing on biodiversity and we're about to engage in a conversation with both public bodies and ENGOs on what comes after uh, the 2020 route map because that's going to be crucially important in terms of Scotland's future diver uh, biodiversity. In terms of how um, that kind of split of responsibilities from you know, statutory, from our core business in terms of supporting biodiversity and then what may be seen as um, new activities, although I don't think they are in relation to urban and disadvantaged communities. Um, what where SNH is, a, is about at its core is improving nature across Scotland and improving access to nature uh, on a sustainable basis for everyone. And we will um, you know, shamelessly chase sources of funding that do that, uh, that you know, will help us do that. If that means that we have to adjust in terms of you know, some of the stipulations on our funding, um, you know, kind of our own funding to make sure we're delivering for the whole of Scotland, um, then, then we will. Johnny, and then um, I'll let to quickly address Mark's question about non-native invasive species, I mean that is a that is a really really good example actually of where at the moment the impacts of invasive non-native species in terms of economic costs that damage the forestry crops and infrastructure in Scotland are estimated to be 200 million a year. Now, if we make an investment in a in a, in a, in a kind of one-off or multiple-year hit in in solving that problem, we're going to save ourselves 200 million pounds a year. If we, if we go for a mend and make do approach, it'll continue to cost us 200 million pounds a year. So that's the answer to that question, I think. Just in terms of this um, question of the conflict between pure nature conservation and nature conservation for, for, the, for the benefits it brings to people, I don't really, I think it's a false dichotomy actually. I think what, what you're doing by um, recovering the natural environment, investing in species conservation, investing in protected areas is actually securing um, a healthy environment for the future generations. Um, biodiversity and, uh, and, and, and the range of native species that we have in Scotland that we are undertaking, I mean, that's the raison d'etre of my organisation as well, that we're undertaking to protect, um, are the foundations for a healthy economy. So by looking after these species and looking after these protected places, we are, that's the underpinning 
um, framework for a healthy environment. So uh, I don't really see the two as, as, as being separate. There may be certain circumstances where, you know, particularly rare protected species may need to be protected from, from, from public disturbance, um, but there are ways and means of doing that. They're, they're rare, I would say. Um, but, but we managed to do that across our suite of 120 nature reserves across Scotland where we have, you know, 30,000 people, school kids, you know, crawling across our nature reserves. But we, some, we, we managed to, 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 um, to manage that in such a way that there's not an impact on the environment. But we are delivering for people as well. But it's fundamental. Uh, species conservation, habitat conservation, protected areas are fundamental to our future generation, as, as Mark pointed out. Uh, and we'd be... I think selling that future generation down the line if we didn't make that investment now in, in securing that resource. And while that in, in itself is going to be hard enough, um, it's just getting more difficult, I think, with, with climate change and, and increasing temperature because the snapshot that we're by and large seeking to preserve in terms of environment is, is, is change is coming because of climate change and, and temperature rises and that problem is just getting so much harder, I think, too, as, as it appears that the investment gets less. Alec, you wanted to say something? If I can add my, the question, I was going to ask it question eight now, because I, I link it to this, um, because I was going to ask, is there, is there more room uh, and potential for uh, closer working together between different agencies and organisations. But I'd like to use this example because in the submission Paths for All, which is an organisation that receives funding from SNH uh, and, and is, is, is about physical activity, they state increasing the number of people in Scotland walking every day thereby improves well-being, physical, mental, social well-being, as well as reducing health inequalities and preventing ill health. And that's a fact, and we know that. The question, I suppose, is how do we therefore encourage people and support people to actually take up the, the walking. So if, NH, if SNH have put the money in to create these groups, support these groups for walking, so is there opportunities like, for example, social prescribing, uh, being one, the links with, with local health centres, the links with local community centres, with youth organisations. Is there, a bit, is there a way that we can have better joined up government to actually, because these are all well-meaning and they are, if, if they're taking up then the preventive spend, and in this case they claim £91 million, but somehow it doesn't all seem to link together. Is there better opportunity there and should we be looking more at joined up working around preventative spend? Uh, Francesca, yes please. Um, I, mean, I think the, the collaboration is there. So Paths for All, um, you mentioned, and Paths for All, as well as providing some of the infrastructure, also do um, you know, work with partners to have local walk leaders. Um, for example, we, in working with um, Green Health Partnerships, uh, support health walks, the national parks, um, also support... Um, a range of health walks. We have our range of services, both at our own hands, but also um, through local authorities, national parks, um, you know, third sector groups. Um, I think there's an interesting tension, perhaps, between a, a nationally driven solution, which is the same for everybody, and one which is more community based and is dependent on you know, local circumstances and you know, using the, the place based um, approach um, again, one which involves local communities in thinking through what is going to help them enjoy their um, local space um, you know, as, as much as possible. And we tend to, and particularly given we do have a really rich asset in terms of our network of local assets, at local offices which are plugged into local communities we tend to respond in that way and so the joining up that you're talking about is often done on on the ground working with local partners be it local authorities increasingly community groups and um, community trusts uh, to put in place the, that type of provision excellent anyone else want to make a contribution to this question uh, um, I think I can answer your question in a very simple way. 
Yes. But then how do you create an infrastructure to sustain that for the longer term? The type of collaboration that we're identifying here is a generational change collaboration. It's not something that's funded on four-year, five-year votes to then be repeated, to then be carried forward. So in answer to the earlier question about, about budgets, budgets that reflect the necessary contributions from different agencies working in collaboration would be an incredible step forward, I think, for all of us working in this field without too much trouble. What you say, but I think that, that notwithstanding the fact that it might be difficult to do, I think there is a, a pressing need for that to be done. And I'd be so bold to su suggest that some, an organisation like Safari, with, under Graham Cook's leadership, that part of that role might be enhanced a little. Um, because I am myself aware, and I'm not particularly well informed, but I first admit that you know, there are different people doing research in their own silos in, in the same areas, uh, whereas if there was a collaborative approach being given to the benefits that we're all seeking to achieve, uh, that was better understood where everyone was in that regard, it needs a body to oversee that, which might be something that, that Safari might be in a position to, to look at, or, or another body perhaps one better known yeah, to, to I'm, you. I'm not in a, a position to comment on Safari. Mm -hmm. I can point out that we're slap bang in the middle of a major reform of the public health system across Scotland with the creation of a new national public health Scotland agency, which will have vested interest in a range of these areas from environmental sustainability through physical activity, through obesity reduction, all of which have a major impact in the areas that we're talking about. Um, the point I was going to make, though, was we have to be clear that the doing of an activity is of itself important, but it may not be sufficient. Physical activity necessary on an individual basis to promote cardiovascular health is actually at a much lower level than to see weight management physical activity or the levels of population physical activity that could give rise to changes in environmental support through carbon reduction in active travel. All of those issues are part of what that nature of the collaboration needs to understand and why that generational change, even within the context of translating the research that we're all talking about here very passionately, is converted into the types of everyday sustainable actions by individuals and the organisations that create the social, economic and cultural environments around that, these people. This year we've seen a major report on the Scottish Burden of Disease Study, which has looked at the impact of inequality. It's very clear. Individual behaviour change of itself will not be sufficient to overcome the changes that need to be inherent in health inequalities associated with the social inequalities, and which many of us around the table and the panel have been touching upon throughout today. That's the sort of collaboration that's needed, not partnerships which reflect each other's budgets and reflect each other's activities. Right. Well, that sounds almost like the last word, but we're going to give the last word to, to Richard, if you want to. Kendi, can you thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we all agree, and I think what we've been dis discussing this morning, that if we want to do anything, it always comes down to money and funding. So in that context, in the context of budgets, do the panel have views on the opportunities or indeed the risks of increasing the proportion of income for ECCLR public bodies for, uh, from charges and fees? Who else, can, who else can we get money off of? <laughs> that sounds like a, a real budget question. Um, Francesca, if you're up for that, we're pleased yep. to hear from you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I mean, I mentioned earlier work that SNH has done on uh, diversification of funding, and we've broken that down into four categories um, funding sources, investment in natural capital, income generation, and cost reduction. Um, and you know, income generation through charges and fees is, is, is what you're kind of talking about there, Richard. So that third category we have looked at that we could charge for planning services we could charge for the licenses that we issue we could <clears throat> charge for some of our advisory services um, there are risks in that in terms of um, you know 
how we would engage with the public if we were in a, a fee paying world. Um, but actually, and we're still kind of working through the risks and opportunities on that. Actually, even if we set our fees at, at, at you know, at probably the extreme end of what the market might take, in relation to our £47 million pound budget, the return would be relatively low, um, probably the um, you know, low hundreds of thousands, maybe up to a million, whereas the potential in some of the other categories that I mentioned, so funding sources, you know, if we were able to access you know, trusts, foundations in a way that, for example, happens in England and Wales, the potential there is, is much bigger. Now, that's not to say we won't progress looking at kind of fees, charges, other ways of generating income at our own hand. You know, sponsorship is another one, but I would want to be realistic on the scale and also just mention that that does change the nature of a public body offering services for all. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to make a contribution on that or indeed any other point before we finish? Um, Johnny first and then uh, Ian. Yeah, I'll, I suppose I'll wrap my point up with the, with, with, with the last discussion as well and that I think if a set of na national outcomes are agreed, then there needs to be budget allocation to deliver those national outcomes. Um, and I, yeah, that's the nature of this conversation today. But um, it seems a very obvious thing to say, but that is, is, is sometimes not the case. So my my fear in 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 saying to public bodies, um, can you look into ways of generating income from your services, is that we'll si we'll simply shift costs. You know, it'll just be a cost shifting exercise. So they'll save money or they'll raise money, and then the budget will be. Um, cut in the future and there won't be any kind of reward I suppose for bringing in those extra funds I think it's probably very different for SEPA than it is for SNH and that SNH are providing um, a, much, a very different kind of service for SEPA I think uh, you know there they may, we may well be areas in which they could charge um, extra funds or, or, or monetize certain aspects of their work but I think for SNH it's very different I think it would also potentially create an awful lot of bureaucracy and you'd have to set up all sorts of bureaucratic systems for m modest gains. So I, I would be slightly nervous, actually, about um, seeing SNH moving into a more uh, uh, char charging for their services type model. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I'll stop there. Um, Ian, did you want to say something on this? Yeah, or indeed any other matter? Because it's a sort of closing opportunity for you all. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was also re reflecting on, uh, yeah, the opportunity possibly to to charge for some of the things that we do. I think, obviously, from our point of view, that that is diff difficult because uh, I guess the evidence why we do stuff was to there was a barrier, I guess, supporting businesses in terms of resource efficiency and and even the work we're doing in the circular economy because it's such an early stage. There was identification that people weren't willing to do that uh, or pay for that, even go to private consultants or otherwise. So. As long as the evidence base is there, we, we continue to do it. But obviously, if that if that shifts, we would we would expect other people to fill the market, so to speak, rather than a, a direct substitution. Uh, but it's still it's still something we we actively uh, evidence annually around. Are we still needed in the space? Uh, what what is the impact of our work, etc.? But could we charge as well? And the the answer is still seen as it is seen as a barrier if you start to charge people for some of this this early work that people are involved in, uh, but some of that could change over time. But I think, I think the, the answer for us is more, I think, how you <coughs> shape the system and the, the policy space as well around that. And I think you begin to see that. I've already mentioned things like producer responsibility, where you're actually, it's not so much us charging people, but actually there is a charge on the production uh, and management of materials through the supply chain that, that it becomes it becomes uh, uh, something that's a uh, responsibility of the producers. I think that's where you start to see the impact on preventative spend, I guess, or, or spend in this space. And I think that's something that we should all be uh, thinking about in terms of not just Scotland, but across the world. Uh, so obviously the obvious, and obvious thing we're working on at the moment is the deposit system, deposit return system for Scotland, which is an example of that where the system will be, to all intents and purposes, self-financing uh, once established. 
uh, and there will be, uh, on the back of that, there will be economic and environmental and social opportunities that we can all uh, get out of the back of that. So it's how we change the system, not so much the mechanics of the system, but actually how we fund the system. That, I think, is the real shift that we need to move to, rather than thinking it is just a case of somebody paying directly for what they're already getting. But that answers that question. Uh, and also going back to another point about procurement, which was raised at the beginning, again, changing the system around procurement would create a market for a lot of the, the businesses that, that are interested in coming into the space. They don't see the market opening up yet. So if you could shape public procurement, particularly around some of the, the service opportunities that are around now uh, for leasing and lending and stuff like that, again, that would change the way that the money flows within the system uh, and to some extent decrease the dependency on, on, on subsidy. So I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there are huge opportunities. It's very interesting. Just uh, when I come here uh, and share the committee with uh, my other environmental colleagues, uh, how uh, even the language is very similar. We talk about assets, natural assets, and we talk about resources in our economy as huge assets for us uh, here in Scotland. But unfortunately, we we are very good at collecting these assets and uh, bundling them up into. Uh, with respect other containers and shipping them out of our country uh, and not realising the real economic potential. So yes, we're, we're diverting from landfill, so there's a huge environmental benefit uh, to be had, but we are missing the, the obvious economic opportunities. So going back to the collection uh, question from Alec about, you know, for every one job there is in the collection of materials for recycling, there's a further eight jobs in the reprocessing, remanufacturing, repurpose, resupply of those materials back into the economy. So that's what we really need to start thinking seriously about. So the investment in the right collection infrastructure, the way that we manage those materials in our economy, the way we manage our assets, just as Johnny uh, talks about in terms of the natural assets, does will reap huge economic and social benefit for, for us here in Scotland. And that is, we are seen as a, a leader uh, in the world in terms of that policy, in terms of that ambition, and in terms of how we're, we're focusing our efforts, uh, particularly around funding. And that's something I think we really need to realise, that the money that we can put in at the start of that process in terms of collection, both at local authority level and at business level, and things like the deposit system in terms of changing the way that people will uh, recycle their cans and bottles in the future, has huge economic opportunity for us. So very much about that preventative spend or, or spending money for future investment and a, a benefit to the economy. Are also polluted beaches with plastic covered in plastic are actually a resource. They're, what you're saying is there, uh, there are an opportunity waiting to be harvested out there to be turned into a new business and, and yep. should, people should be encouraged to go and do that. Absolutely. If you shift the, if you shift the, kind of the price point, I guess, it's quite, I mean, it's not something probably to labour too much, but uh, last week when the, the initiative, I can't remember the name of the initiative, with the flying over all the, the coastline and taking pictures of all yes. the plastics. Uh, fantastic initiative, but uh, the day that was uh, it was on the, the BBC News, I was, I was down south with uh, a company who we are investing in to produce a plant, uh, people will know, Project Beacon in Perthshire. Uh, they, ha they will have a facility to turn that plastic that's lying on the beaches into uh, benefit, economic benefit, jobs, product, high value product that can be used back into the Scottish econ economy. That's a fact. Uh, well, and, and, and that is, so there is a resource lying on our beach, although at this moment in time it's a, it's a shock to the system. So we can change the system, both we can clean up the beaches and there'll be an outcome from that, but also we need to stop it in the first place because there will be a valid plant uh, in Perthshire which will be able to tackle that, that plastic. And I can only imagine that Visit Scotland would be happy with such a, an effort as well. And it seems an appropriate moment to bring you in, Rudolf. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, we've been actively looking at alternative <coughs> sources of revenue um, to, <coughs> excuse me, to both the organisation but also to support our, our activity. <coughs> our partners in Scottish Tourism Alliance, who represent the industry, tell us very, very clearly that um, tourism businesses are struggling because of increased costs. And so that's not a major source. But I think we need to be a wee bit more creative in terms of looking at potential sources of, of uh, income. Um, CSR budgets for uh, organisations that are not necessarily directly involved in the environment or in tourism. Um, and, and also some of the really big players that uh, can see a commercial benefit themselves from working with the environment or, or tourism. I'll give you a good example. We, <clears throat> we're just about to kick off a, a fairly major... 
um, study on um, data and how it can help us make decisions. Uh, and we're looking at um, what are people saying about the current uh, visitor experience uh, in Scotland um, on social media? Um, and working with the big social media companies who see a benefit in getting the result at the end of the day. So um, we're, we're talking to the likes of MasterCard and IBM and Amadeus and Expedia, who are really big companies in their own right that have a lot of data, and mining that data to get the information that we need. Sometimes means that um, they don't necessarily are not going to spend money, but actually we can tap into their huge resources. So I think it is about being more creative rather than just simply thinking about charging people or going to the same um, source of revenue all the time. Uh, businesses, certainly in our um, experience, um, we charge for our quality assurance scheme, but only to cover the cost. Um, and through European state aid uh, regulations, we're not um, enabled to do very much more than that. So that's forced us to be a wee bit more creative. So I think the answer to your question is look beyond the usual suspects and be more creative, because I think there is money there. <coughs> Excellent. Everyone had their say? Fine. Francesca. Just, I mean, one final point um, in the sessions being about preventative spend. Um, and, I mean, in terms of SNH, and you know, I think SWT would echo this, I hope we've been able to demonstrate that investment in nature is a great investment in terms of preventative spend and more than delighted to follow up on any of the points today to, to help with that evidence. Right. Um, very much appreciated. Um, thank you all for your contributions, Johnny, Francesca, Phil, uh, Riddle, Ian. Uh, we're very grateful to you for taking time um, to come and inform this committee today of your thoughts on the budget process. We're, as you can tell, particularly interested in the pre preventative spend um, and the health benefits of, of this as well. So your uh, information has been much appreciated and very valuable to us. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and we'll now uh, talk about the future meeting details. Um, and at its next meeting on the 11th of September, the committee will hear from stakeholders and from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2019-20. Um, and as agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and the public uh, gallery be vacated, please. And I now um, declare this part of the meeting closed. Thank you all. <laughs>